the economic situation in Germany following World War I and the Versailles Treaty led to the wholesale implementation of Hitler's policies. But they started killing children first and then a bit later on started killing adults. It's not surprising that the nurses in the, in the Nazi era got caught up in all this. The propaganda was everywhere about killing people who were considered life unworthy of life. Useless feeders was the term they used. The nurses were the ones who uh, held the children while they were being killed. They gave them the overdoses of drugs. They were the ones who put them out on the verandas to die of hypothermia. The nurses were the ones who withheld the feeding so the children would die of starvation. After World War I ended in 1918, Germany went through severe economic hardships and the nation saw the rise of different political factions and ideals. One group that emerged was Adolf Hitler and his National Socialist Party. Of course, there was rampant inflation, there was great poverty and social disadvantage because of the reparations which had to be paid back after the Treaty of Versailles. Money was devaluated and uh, they saw a strong leader that was restoring order. By 1933, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party had taken control of Germany, and this began a period of racial hygiene laws, persecution, and death camps. Hitler wanted to create the master race and eliminate Jews and other people he considered inferior to the Aryan race. Innocent children and concentration camp prisoners suffered through horrific medical experiments. All of this was accomplished with the assistance of German doctors and nurses. The basis for Hitler's plan of racial hygiene was a concept called eugenics, which is the pseudoscience of developing a superior race. Before Hitler came to power across the world, the whole theory of eugenics was something that many nations had embraced. Eugenics is the belief that through selective breeding, whether it's cows, sheep, people, whatever, through selective breeding, positive eugenics is the ability to breed offspring that will carry the best traits this theory of eugenics, how people should be allowed to breed to the benefit of the human race and those who, who weren't fit and healthy should not be allowed to have children. Caught on in England, the United States, Japan, Scandinavia. Germany was not at the forefront of this. And the Nazis actually learned much of their eugenics initially from the US. Some of these eugenic health care policies were developed in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These U.S. policies were emulated by Germany and incorporated into the governing philosophy of applied biology. There were laws on the book in Virginia that said that you could sterilize people. Um, and the Nazis took their 1933 sterilization law and mimicked it after the U.S. law. Yeah, in fact, there was a time in which there were letters uh, in the U.S. journals saying, look at the Nazis have gotten ahead of us. We've got to catch up. And so, of course, when Hitler came along with his racial theories, he realized that this eugenics was a really good idea, and he manipulated it to fit his racial theories, all mixed in with the Jews, the Gypsies, everybody else who was considered uh, racially inferior. All of this would lead to an appalling era in world history called the Holocaust, a period of persecution and mass murder. The Holocaust has been defined as the 12 year period from Hitler's rise to power in 1933 until the end of the war, 1945. It was a government planned, government supported mass extermination or mass killing 
And uh, while it was targeted towards Jewish people, there were many other groups of individuals that suffered during the Holocaust. Hitler convinced the German people that the Jews were their enemy and the cause of their problems. He then created an atmosphere of racial intolerance and hatred of people deemed to be racially inferior. So every genocide, whether it's Rwanda, the Holocaust, begins with we versus them. So Hitler used the Jews and later other people as scapegoats for all that was wrong in Germany, particularly the economic woes. So he set up the we versus them. He institutionalized them. In 1933, the Nazi government passed the Nuremberg Laws for the protection of hereditary health. This legalized involuntary sterilization. So Hitler found a perfect meshing of his Nazi ideology with the eugenic Nazi medicine or racial hygiene movement. Germany's sterilization laws led to the involuntary sterilization by doctors of about 400,000 Germans. Nazi doctors sterilized citizens against their will, euthanized 200,000 disabled German children and adults, and created the gas chambers and crematoria that were used for the mass murder of six million Jews, Poles, and Gypsies. Without the full support of physicians, scientists, and nurses, the Holocaust, as it unfolded, could never have happened. In the U.S., there were laws that could require that people be sterilized against their will. Sterilization laws were widespread in the U.S., most notably in Indiana and North Carolina. But other states, including California and Virginia, allowed sterilization even into the 1970s. In fact, in the early 20th century, the U.S. led the world in compulsory sterilizations. A very famous law was passed in Virginia. They said it was okay to sterilize the retarded. And it was brought before the Supreme Court. And Oliver Wendell Holmes said, three generations of imbeciles is enough, saying that it was okay to sterilize. But it didn't go further. While in Germany, it became the leading ideology. Then it was implemented into action. Hitler promised the German people they were creating the master race. I think the master race would have been uh, the Nazis' view of a strong, um, blonde, blue-eyed, healthy person who had no genetic defects and who was pure Aryan. In the 1920s and 30s, Germany's medical community was considered the best in the world. You weren't a real doctor in the U.S. unless you went to Germany to study, and then you came back and said, you know, I studied in Germany. I think with that came some arrogance and some feeling that uh, we are so superior to everybody else. I studied medicine in Germany. I know some of the best uh, uh, teaching of uh, anatomy, physiology, and uh, medicine came from Germany. Germany was very advanced, not only in the medical field, but Germany was uh, the best civilization in the, among the European countries. It was the height of technology, the height of uh, science. How was it possible that these people became murderers? The majority of nurses were not members of the Nazi party. However, to have a job in Germany, a nurse had to belong to one of several nursing organizations. There were five organizations for nurses. Among these, the National Socialist Nurses and the Red Cross Nurses swore an oath of allegiance to Hitler. Additionally, the Protestant Nurses Organization said that it greets National Socialism with an open heart. Surprisingly, 
more physicians, uh, percentage-wise, joined the Nazi party than the population in general. And I think physicians uh, were very taken with the fact that we can use our science to uh, improve the human race. Many physicians and nurses enthusiastically supported the Nazi regime and were involved in all aspects of the Holocaust. About 40% of German physicians were in the Nazi party, while the lawyers and, and teachers and the other white-collar professions uh, joined in much lesser numbers. Uh, if you didn't join the, the Nazi uh, party, there was no uh, retribution. Using inflammatory propaganda, Hitler and the Nazis began a campaign against the Jews. And I know that um, my father used to say that bad things are happening to Jewish people in Germany. They're being discriminated against. Jewish children can no longer go to their regular school. People cannot keep their jobs at the university or, or other professions. Hitler said, follow me, never mind uh, God, never mind religion. Just follow me, do what I am asking you to do. And since the regime was totalitarian, and they were very good at uh, public campaigns and propaganda, uh, and they had enough scientists and physicians that were already uh, marching to the drum. Propaganda is an extremely powerful way to convince people to their way of thinking. Germany's medical establishment began to support the Nazi party, except for Jewish doctors who were ostracized. The official uh, journal of, of the German Medical Association started to, to uh, have a swastika on their uh, journal and they got rid of all the Jewish physicians, uh, uh, authors, uh, people in office of all the different associations and societies very quickly. And in five or six years, they got them out of all the, the academic and, and professional establishment. After years of strong Nazi propaganda, Germany's doctors and nurses began to accept the belief that racial hygiene would be good for the nation. Social Darwinism said we need to eliminate these inferior people that were handicapped, that were maybe mentally uh, disturbed. Uh, we want a healthy, thriving society. In Germany, the, the proponents of the eugenic movement were the most prominent, the most powerful, the establishment, uh, the legal system became Nazified immediately. Well, of course, it required lawyers, it required doctors, it required bureaucrats, it required administrators, but many of the nurses were the ones who actually carried out the injections. But for a long time, nurses were the agents of the physicians, and the physicians in the Nazi period were agents of the state. So that's very important because physicians were no longer asked to care for patients, but to care for the state, the folk, the, 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 the German folk. And so what was good for the state was what was important, not what was good for an individual patient. Obedience was still a very much a part of the way nurses were taught and the way we thought. So it's not surprising that the nurses in the, in the Nazi era got caught up in all this. Euthanasia programs were established in Nazi Germany in which children and adults were killed if they were considered unfit for life and were a burden on the state. The true meaning of euthanasia would be the mercy killing of a person with their permission or their request. However, this was not the case in Nazi Germany. These killings were without consent. They were murders. In the 1920s, German lawyer Karl Binding and German psychiatrist Alfred Hoche co-authored the book The Permission to Destroy Life Unworthy of Life. This book greatly influenced Hitler's thinking about euthanasia. Everybody had that propaganda thrown at them. It, it, was, it was common, it was, it was everywhere. And it, it espoused the idea that people who were in some way deficient should be killed so that they didn't carry on 
the defective genes and so that they weren't a burden on the state. So the nurses, just as everybody else in society, were susceptible to this. The nurses were working in hospitals where children with disabilities, people with mental illnesses, a whole range of conditions were cared for. They weren't coerced into becoming part of these programs. Once you accept humans can be humanized, eventually you can engage in exterminating it. And this was a gradual and very powerful and unfortunately very effective process that took place in Germany. The Nazi euthanasia program first started in 1939 as a means to eliminate handicapped children. Do you have families who, because of all the propaganda, are believing that to have a child with negative traits is a bad thing. It's bad for the health of Germany. They were killing children with disabilities, children with Down syndrome, children with cardiac anomalies, children with cerebral palsy, children who didn't develop normally, who were considered to be useless feeders. That was the term used. Uh, public health nurses would go to the families, promise them, if you will give your child to us, your child will get the best care. And so people were falsely led to believe that and relinquish their children. The nurses were involved in the killing of children by giving them overdoses, by taking them outside, knowing that it was going to contribute to their death. I got very interested in this when, it, when I found out that nurses actively killed their patients. And I became intrigued into how they could come to believe that killing was a legitimate part of their caring role, which they did. The propaganda around the whole idea of killing people for the good of the state was profound. Even down to children doing exercises in their school books on how much it costs to keep people with a disability, for example. Midwives and physicians were mandated by German law to report any infant born with a birth defect and the infant would be placed in an institution. Midwives were paid for each birth that they reported Midwives were licensed. They had to go through a similar training of period as nursing, and, and many of them were independent practitioners. So not long after the child was put into a home, he or she would then be moved to another institution further away. Of course, there was no consent, no nothing. These killings were done without the parents' approval, more or less, in the main. The nurses and the midwives who were involved in the carrying out maybe not even the, the ideology, but were actually the doers of the euthanasia program. Euthanasia is really a euphemism for murder because these were not terminally ill patients. These were children that were taken and murdered, mostly children who had handicap or mental retardation. I think one deciding point is in Germany, the notion that the health of the public is more important than the health of the individual. So consequently, to remove an unhealthy element was seen as good. In September 1939, a decision was made to develop an adult euthanasia program for patients in psychiatric facilities. Hitler picked the date to coincide with Germany's invasion of Poland. To expand it to include adults, the only way we're going to make this acceptable is to say, we need these hospital beds for the war wounded. Why should the state pay to keep totally disabled people alive when our young guys are sent to the front, need to come back home and have care. The name of this killing organization was T4. Eventually, six killing centers were established. 
medical staffs were ordered to fill out questionnaires to evaluate whether their patients should live or die. Patients were placed in gas chambers that looked like showers. Then lethal carbon monoxide was pumped into the chambers, killing the patients. You have to justify and rationalize what you're doing because you're doing it. But they actually believed it. And they actually believed that what they were doing was saving the folk from, from its contamination, from the infection, uh, that there was a disease. And the disease was the handicapped and the infirmed, and that they needed to be cured through killing, healing through killing. They were told they were being transferred. The nurses packed their clothes, their lunch, rode with them on the buses. The hospitals, these six, had specially constructed kind of breezeways that the buses would go through so the patients could be unloaded into the hospital without being viewed by the community. However, it didn't take long for the communities near these hospitals to realize what was going on. People would see the buses. The buses were very unique, painted gray. The windows were painted over and so forth. The buses would arrive, and within a very short period of time, this acrid smoke would be billowing out of the chimneys. Each hospital had a department to write condolence letters to the families. And there were mix-ups. They would write and say, we're sorry to tell you your uncle Hans died of appendicitis. And maybe he'd already had his appendix removed. People were re becoming quite knowledgeable about what was going on. Even children would taunt other children, saying they're going to put you on the gray bus. You're going to go up the chimney. As knowledge of the gassing of patients became widespread, the decision was made to end the T4 euthanasia program in August 1941. This, however, did not end the killing of patients. The children's euthanasia program continued unabated until the end of the war. After the end of the T4 program, physicians were granted permission to provide a merciful death to any person they deemed to be suffering. These killings, which took place at many hospitals throughout the Third Reich, were known as wild euthanasia or decentralized euthanasia and were carried out on an individual basis rather than by gassing. Patients, usually selected by physicians but killed by nurses, were administered overdoses of sedatives. More people died in wild euthanasia than in T4. Why did the nurses follow orders to kill? We do know that the doctors were the ones who signed the certificates that said whether the child was to live or die. It was the nurses who carried out the, the killings. The doctors didn't necessarily carry out the killings themselves. They may have dictated who was to die, but it was the nurses who carried out the killings. There are episodes where the nurses decided themselves to take things into their own hands and kill the patients because they knew they were going to die anyway, so um, he was suffering, so I'll, I'll do it now. He's going to die anyway, so I might as well do it quicker. There is the most mesmerizing quote from one of the nurses who talks about how lovingly we held them in our arms while we got them to drink this medication. We didn't want them to suffer more than necessary while they were killing. More than 70 years later, the question of how Germany's nurses became involved in these killings still intrigues historians. Well, it is, uh, of course, a multifaceted uh, phenomenon, I think, what happened there. Uh, 
but it is a very good example of you start one thing and then it leads to something a little worse and a little worse. So at first, if they were asked to hold a patient while somebody else uh, did something, an injection or whatever, uh, they, they could do that and they could say to themselves, I'm not the one taking any action here. And then uh, from there, it's a shorter step to, well, you give the injection. For some nurses, I can see that this could, they could easily fall into the trap of thinking that this was the right thing to do. To me though, the whole issue is interesting because there's a line that, as a nurse that you cross. And I think also in that era, uh, nurses were very subservient and very obedient, and whatever the uh, doctor said they should do, they felt they had to obey and do that or fear the consequences. And similar to their obedience to physicians, nurses were also educated to be obedient to senior nurses, who at times also ordered killings. Nurses were involved in actually the killings themselves, either through active means or through passive means, letting patients starve or exposing them to hazards where they would get pneumonia and other things and die. In 1939, World War II began when the Germans attacked and invaded neighboring Poland. Our building was actually also hit. Polish survivor Anna Steinberger recalls the bombing. Mid -rise. And I could see the flames on the roof of the building. I asked my mom, what is going on? Do I go to school? And she says, no school today. Just go hide in the, in the cellar. Polish Jews were rounded up into ghettos and later moved to other institutions for medical experiments. A decision was made by the Nazis in January of 1942 at the Wannsee Conference to go further with the final solution and move the Jews into death camps. So there were four camps that were specifically created as death camps. Belzec, Kelmo, Treblinka, and Sobibor. There were two additional concentration camps that developed a killing portion. That would be Madonic and Auschwitz. Some skilled workers were kept alive to work in the camps. And the infrastructure and the know-how and the personnel of the 64 centers was actually transferred to uh, Belgium, Sobibor, and Treblinka, and they have built the first gas chambers. And then some of the same doctors and nurses who were involved in the euthanasia program uh, took the gas chambers down and reassembled them in East, in the Poland, at the, at the concentration camps, where doctors selected at the ramps and were involved in supervising the gassings and killings. So physicians were involved in all aspects. Ravensbrück, located in Germany, was a camp for women. Most of the women were Polish. They, there were some Jews there, but most of the women had, were dissenters or uh, women who'd caused trouble to the Nazis when the Nazis occupied Poland. Ravensbrück was located close to one of the largest and most important hospitals in Germany, where a lot of research was going on. Reinhard Heydrich was, was the Nazi protector of Czechoslovakia, who in 1942 was killed by a bomb. He died from infection of the wounds that he got. He died several days later. Hitler demanded that doctors should find a cure for these deadly infections. And so Ravensbrück, which was close by, had all these women there that they used as lab rats, basically. The women were operated on with, uh, by the surgeons from this hospital. They had things like wounds created in their legs that were filled up with sawdust, dirt, ground glass, 
to see what would happen to the wound, how wounds developed, how bone became infected. As some of these women were sent to the gas chambers afterwards, they were killed. Uh, some of the women died, of course, from the experiments, and some of the women survived to give testimony in the trials. But nurses were definitely involved in those experiments. Many German physicians and nurses participated in medical experiments related to racial hygiene in the concentration camps and hospitals. One of the worst was Dr. Joseph Mengele, a member of the SS. Then the cattle car doors opened and we stepped down onto a little strip of land called the, the selection platform. We had no idea where we were. All we really knew that we did not arrive in Hungary, but we were taken to Germany, which meant to us that the end was near because there were a lot of rumors for four years under Hungarian occupation that Jews were being taken to Germany and murdered. Eva My, Moses Kor is a survivor of the notorious Auschwitz, children. where she and her twin sister Miriam suffered under Dr. Joseph Mengele and his experiments on twins. There were four of us in the family, children and parents. My mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand because we were her youngest children and she was hoping that as long as she could hold on to us, that she could protect us. Everything was moving very fast. I was on that little strip of land called the selection platform, not longer than 10 minutes. And in my childish curiosity, I looked around trying to figure out what that place was when I realized that my father and two older sisters disappeared in the crowd and I never saw them again. <clears throat> so as we were holding on to mother, a Nazi was running, yelling in German, thrilling it, thrilling it, twins, twins. We did not volunteer any information because we really had no idea what worked in that place. We were extremely troubled, confused, and exhausted. And he noticed us, approached us, because we were dressed alike and we looked alike, and he demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother didn't know what to say. She asked if that was good. And the Nazi nodded yes, and my mother said yes. Then another Nazi came, pulled my mother in one direction. We were pulled in the opposite direction. As I look back, I remember my mother's arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never got to say goodbye to her, but of course I didn't really realize that this would be the last time we would see her. And all that took no longer than about 30 minutes. Miriam and I were alone. We had no idea what would happen to us. And all that was done to us for no other reason except that we were Jewish and we really didn't understand why that was a crime. Then they lined us up for registration and tattooing and when my turn came, I decided to give them as much trouble as a 10-year-old could. Four people, two women prisoners and two Nazis restrained me. They pinned me on a bench while they heated a gadget that it looked like a writing pen with a needle at the end. And then when the needle got really hot, they dipped it into ink and they burned into my left arm the capital letter A-7063. The twins were housed in barracks according to age and sex. We became part of a group of little girls, all twins. In our transport, there were certain sets of little girls, age two to age 16. That is the way they housed us in our barrack, according to age and sex. After roll call, we would go back to the barrack for Dr. Mengele's daily inspection. He would always come in dressed in his shiny uniforms, gleaming black boots, white gloves, and a baton in his hand, and he would count us. He wanted to know... After breakfast, morning, the twins would be readied for experiments. Yeah. We would walk to Auschwitz I and place naked in a barrack maybe 20, 30 sets of twins for six to eight hours. Every part of my body was measured 
compared to charts, compared to my twin sister. Those experiments were not dangerous, but they were unbelievably demeaning. And even in Auschwitz, I couldn't cope to cope with it for six to eight hours. The only way that I could is by blocking it out of my mind. So even today, I have very limited information on those long hours. Three days a week, the children would be taken to a blood lab. There, they would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm. At the same time, they would give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. The content of those injections, we didn't know then, nor do I know today. They, to the best of my knowledge, they were germs, diseases, and drugs. Because the German pharmaceutical company was very heavily involved in the experiments in Auschwitz. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever effect. I desperately tried to hide. The rumor in the camp was that anyone taken to the hospital never came back. So I did not want to be taken to the hospital. My fever was high. Both of my legs and arms were swollen and very, very painful. And I had huge red patches throughout my body, the size of a small apple or an egg. According to the Auschwitz Museum, at least 1,500 sets of twins were used by Mengele in his experiments. Less than 200 survived. Some died as a result of the conditions in the camp, but the majority died as a result of the experiments. Oh, no, they were truly monsters. The stuff that happened was horrendous. There's no ethical justification for, much of what the, for most of what they did under the name of medical science. It was done totally without informed consent. The people used as lab rats had no choice. They were often killed immediately afterwards. They had the most horrendous things done to them. In the sterilization experiments performed at Auschwitz, it was often the nurses who would select and prepare the patients for the experiments. Uh, then they assisted whatever the physician needed the nurse assistant to do and uh, kept it secret from the patients as to what was going to happen, giving false reassurance that everything is going to be all right, we're taking good <coughs> care of you. At Dachau, a variety of unethical medical experiments were made using the prisoners as guinea pigs. Some of the cruelties are almost unbelievable. They had a purpose for each one of these, usually to benefit downed uh, German pilots, in freezing water or some other battlefield result. Author Vivian Spitz was an eyewitness court reporter for the Nuremberg war crimes trials of Nazi doctors. She refers to her book, Doctors from Hell, as she recalls the trial testimony she reported. The victims were German, Czech, and Polish gypsies who were deprived of food and given only brackish yellow seawater for days resulting in, of course, excruciating pain and foaming at the mouth and, in most cases, madness. Many of these patients died. Many of these patients died. They did experimentations where they would keep people in uh, freezing temperatures until they were almost dead, revive them, and then expose them again. Lower the temperature, raise the temperature until they froze and died. And then they took them directly to the, to the autopsy table in what they call terminal experiments. And so they did low pressure studies where they took uh, concentration camp prisoners and put them into specially designed rooms where they sucked out the oxygen, let in the oxygen until their lungs exploded and they died in terminal experiments. There were studies of bone and, and muscle and infectious diseases. They were trying out new antibiotics. So they took concentration camp prisoners and cut open and filleted and infected their legs and wounds to create simulated wounds. We know that the uh, sterilization program, the uh, mercy killing program, and the human, the, the unlawful, atrocious human experimentation program were masterminded, uh, planned, suggested, 
uh, implemented by physicians. Dr. Joseph Mengele was able to escape from Germany after the war and avoided apprehension by authorities. Joseph Mengele was the worst that we never got. Mengele's family was very wealthy manufacturers in Bavaria, and they managed to hide him until they could get him out of Germany. Dr. Mengele lived in South America until 1979, when he reportedly drowned while swimming at a resort in Brazil. Finally, in May 1945, the war in Europe ended when the Germans surrendered to the Allies and the guns were silent. After the war, the Allies conducted the famous Nuremberg trials and the world became aware of the atrocities of the Nazi doctors and nurses. We don't know the figures of the nurses who were involved because they were the workforce in these hospitals. Although nurses were not named as defendants in the medical trials at Nuremberg, the results of some of their actions during the war were brought to light. For example, the horrific experiments done on young Polish women at Ravensbrück and the killing of the disabled persons in the so-called euthanasia programs were made public. Nurses, however, were not exonerated for their crimes. Many stood trial later on, and several were hanged for their actions, including two male nurses from the Hadamar euthanasia site. Numerous subsequent trials of nurses resulted in prison sentences. At other trials, nurses were acquitted despite admitting their guilt. There was a trial for the nurses, and I think there were 14 in all, and none of them were convicted. The first trial of the first nurse and the first physician was in 1946, and it was the nurse and physician at Maserat. And interestingly, both of them received the death sentence and were hanged. The nurses who were tried in 1965, there were 15 nurses from Maserat to be tried. One killed herself the night before the trial. So 14 nurses were tried. And the reasons they gave were, I thought I was relieving people from their suffering. These people had no life at all. Um, I needed to keep my job. I think probably loss of memory and other things that had changed during that time, uh, the nurses were not held accountable. And they used the defense, too, that I was only following orders. Just following orders was not going to be an acceptable defense to murder, to genocide. And what, one of the things that came out of Nuremberg was the notion that everybody is responsible for their own actions. But the baffling thing to me is still the trial in 1965 of the 14 Messerets nurses. They had had 20 years to think about what they had done. Those nurses did not deny what they did. One of them said, yes, I probably killed 210 people. Now, the nurses from Spiegelgrün were tried after the war. Anna Kachenka is one of them, and received several years in prison. Not all of the nurses under the Third Reich were compliant with the Nazi ideology. One Austrian SS nurse, Maria Stromberger, showed great compassion toward prisoners at Auschwitz. She had heard some of the things that were going on at Auschwitz and just could not believe it because she said, we're a good and moral people. We wouldn't do this. So she went and said, transfer me to Auschwitz. I want to work there. So her goal was to work caring for the inmates. Eventually, she gained their trust and would smuggle out letters, documents, photographs. She smuggled in ammunition. She saved the lives of many of them. 
Perhaps the most famous of the trials held at Nuremberg before an international military tribunal was the so-called medical case, or the doctor's trial. Karl Brandt, who was the chief physician of Hitler, said, I did the, what needed to be done. This was good what we did. We made German people healthier. So people were convinced that they are doing something positive in all these atrocities. 23 physicians and scientists were tried for crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity was a new concept, which was whether it be wartime, not wartime, there were certain things beyond the pale and we were going to hold people accountable. So genocide uh, was a classic example of a crime against humanity. And so the doctors were on trial. Today, many of these killing centers are memorials open to the public. But in spite of the bucolic setting, they were centers of inhumane experiments, mass murder, and extermination. Many of these institutions remain working psychiatric hospitals even today. It looked like a college campus. It was beautiful. I've been to uh, prisons, uh, death camps in both Germany and Austria. It's not quite the same because the place is more or less clean and, of course, empty. And so you have to, to stand there and be there to kind of uh, think how would it have been when it was so crowded and it was so dirty and they didn't have water to drink. One of the patients I'm familiar with drank water from the floor and died from an infection. And it's just hard to be in those places and realize the conditions that were there. Spiegelgrund is still a large active hospital in Vienna. During the Holocaust, it consisted of a children's ward and became infamous for the euthanasia of the children there. The brains of many of these children were saved for years in the basement of Spiegelgrund. I think it is good that they're open to the public because you can read about it and you can see pictures, but until you are actually there and standing there, you don't get the emotions and the, the feeling uh, that you would otherwise. All right, looks like he might have a rhythm back on the monitor. It's sinus, but slow. Although current healthcare in the U.S. is regarded as among the best in the world, there are elements that should cause us to reflect upon the similarities to German medicine in the 1930s. So it, it's important that for us, both as um, nurses who are looking at history and nurses working today, that we know about this history. Because unless we know, we can't stop it happening again. And it will happen again. Today, nurses are involved in the legal euthanasia of patients in Belgium, Holland, and Switzerland. Nurses are also involved in executions in the countries where the death penalty is legal. My take on it is that the nurses working in those areas should know the history so that they themselves can determine whether it's relevant to what they're doing and ask themselves the question, is this an ethical area in which I want to work? We physicians, nurses, okay, have back. a power that, if we are not careful, can be abused. Okay. Thank you. So by learning about how this power was abused in the worst way, we hope that you will inoculate yourself and be conscious and aware and, and reflective. Or how does any person know what is right from wrong? And I think that I have to have a conscience, a conscience and a moral compass. That if somebody has no morality, then it's very difficult for them to really understand or judge for their own knowledge what is wrong and what is right. But if it hurts another human being, I think that it's morally wrong. I'm just amazed, even today, to ask someone who's a freshman in high school what they knew about the Nuremberg trials, and they don't know what you're talking about. 
Many young people today are not aware of the Holocaust and its place in history. They know that it was something happened what they think is a long time ago and it's over and it's never going to happen again, so why should we keep bringing it up? Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that is exactly what is happening. I think it's important for all healthcare professionals to study what we've done in the past and to, to learn how those particular doctors and nurses and dentists and other health professionals got involved in the acts that they got involved in because we're dealing with the same issues today and we always need to be alert. Let's hold CPR for a second. Regulatory procedures in the nursing profession today are more stringent than in the 1920s and 30s. There is an American Nurse Nurses Association. They have a code of ethics for nursing that guides the ethical conduct of nursing, but there is no regulatory backup for that code. It is simply a guidance. I think what is happening today is medical errors where sometimes nurses and others don't speak up when they see an error that's possible and that's likely to occur and they don't speak up for fear of, uh, well, the doctor must know what he or she is doing and uh, I don't want to embarrass myself by saying something and then it turns out not to be true. Today, medical experts are facing new technological and social issues. Uh, so I'm quite concerned about the physician-assisted suicide movement. Uh, in the U.S. Um, I think it's easier to get yourself killed than it is to get health care. I'm concerned when you have 40 million people who have access to no health care that you offer them euthanasia, you offer them assisted suicide. With these new developments, could the world see another era of unethical medical practices and experiments? You know, after the Holocaust, the, the motto was never again, never again should the Holocaust happen. I think the, the uh, lesson we have learned from the Nazi era and the Holocaust is that we are all vulnerable to outside pressures, uh, influences, and that things can happen that we may not see at the time, that things are going awry, and that's why we have to all be on our guard and we have to monitor ourselves, we have to monitor each other because the healthcare environment is very challenging. A couple of takeaways from what we learned about the nurses in the Holocaust. I think the first one is how easy it is to become involved, especially in the beginning. How easy w was it for those nurses just to take a patient to a special room? They didn't know what the room was for. They were simply taking a patient to a special room. How long did it take them to actually find out that every patient who went to that room did not come out alive? That could take quite a long period of time. Once you've started doing that, then maybe you're asked to help give a patient medication. So slowly the nurses could have gotten involved and not even known what they were doing. Learning about the Holocaust is, is a, a, a very powerful way to learn empathy and compassion. Only by educating people that we must learn to live in peace and harmony with each other regardless of color of the skin or background or economic uh, situation and so on. But the question, of course, is how did one of the most advanced societies, advanced in art, music, theater, writing, uh, medicine was, you weren't a real doctor in the U.S. unless you went to Germany to study, and then you came back and said, you know, I studied in Germany. Uh, and so it was the height of technology, the height of uh, science, how was it possible that these people became murderers? It's easy to believe the Holocaust could never be repeated. The factors leading up to it are not unique to Germany. They are human factors that are present in every country, every culture, and every generation. If it could happen in one of the most advanced societies in human history, it can happen again anywhere. If it happened in Germany, then it can happen anywhere else, so we must be very, very vigilant. It's up to each of us to learn from the past and be ready to interrupt the forces that may try to exploit the few for the benefit of the majority. <laughs>